rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya al mursaleen, wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'een. Respected brothers and sisters, welcome to this week's Ikna ILF Understanding the Quran series. Inshallah, we'll be continuing with the study of Surah An Nisa, verses 105 to 115. And today's session will be conducted by Brother Masim. I think he just left. Maybe we need wait for a minute. Yeah, if you can just be patient with us for a few seconds, we will uh, get Brother Masim back. Shall I begin? Ah, yes, inshallah. Sorry, I got disconnected for a second. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah, wa nashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika la, wa nashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh, allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man tabi'a hudayhum bi ahsan liyam al-deen. The ayat we're going to cover today, inshallah, from Surah An-Nisa, <clears throat> 11 ayat in Surah An-Nisa, they talk about a single theme. And that theme is within a context. That theme is a theme of honesty. And the idea that we should not be honest simply because somebody will find out. But the primary reason why we should be honest is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and is in control at all times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins in uh, surah, in ayah 105, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim, Inna anzalna ilayka al-kitaba bil-haqqi, litahkuma bayna al-nasi bima araka Allahu, wa la takun lil-khainina khasima. Indeed, we have sent down to you, to you, O Muhammad, the scripture, with the truth to judge between mankind in accordance to what Allah has revealed. And, to not be, and do not be an advocate for the treacherous. Now, it's a really interesting ayah because it was revealed in a context. And here I want to share the story in the con uh, of the context in which this ayah was revealed. It's a very specific story about a person who was among the hypocrites uh, of Medina. And his name is Tu'ma ibn Ubayriq, uh, also known, and that's his nickname. His uh, name is Al-Harith ibn Amr. And uh, he was one of the people that accepted Islam after the Messenger Sallallahu Wasallam migrated to Medina. It is said that he attended the Battle of Uhud, but it is not confirmed that he did. And he was a poet who was in the habit actually of writing poetry attacking the companions. So his story is that Tu'am ibn Bashir stole from his uncle. He stole two shields, some, you know, some... some uh, Weaponry, he stole two shields and he stole some food and some other things. And he uh, took them and he hid them in the home of Zayd ibn Samir as a Sumair, who was one of the Jewish people of Medina. Now, the Jewish man, Zayd, did not know that these things were stolen. He said, just keep these things. He kept those things. So when finally they found out about it and they asked, uh, they asked about the two uh, shields, Toma, they asked him about the two shields. He denied that he knows anything about them and he swore by Allah that he did not take them. Wallahi, I did not steal them. And he has no knowledge about them. And uh, when uh, Qatada, his uncle, heard about the, uh, uh, the shields being in the home of the Jewish man, he went to him and he asked for them. So the Jewish man said, the Torma gave them to, him, to, to me to keep. So Zayd, uh, who's the Jewish man, took Qatada to the message, uh, with Qatada, they went to the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to judge between them. Each man is claiming that he should keep the shields. So when he went to the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and by the way, the story does not clearly say that he sold them to Zayd, but it appears from context that he sold them to Zayd. So when they went to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, each one of them brought his evidence. And in fact, uh, the, uh, the uh, Jewish man did not really have a lot of evidence in support of why he has them in, the, in his possession. Why, do you, why are you keeping the shields of somebody else and nobody is claiming to have sold them to you? 
In this, the ayah 5, 105 was revealed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ لِتَحْكُمَ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ بِمَا أَرَاكَ اللَّهُ وَلَا تَكُنْ لِلْخَائِنِينَ خَصِيمًا We have revealed to you the book so that you judge between people with justice or with truth that Allah has shown you and do not be a defender of those who betray. The ayah does not say with truth. The ayah just says you should judge as Allah has shown you. But the implicit meaning is with truth or with justice. So what Allah is saying here is that it is a command to rule with justice. Now here is a man who is supposedly a Muslim. And here is a man who is clearly not a Muslim. But the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in this moment acting as a judge. And as a judge, he has to rule fairly and justly. Now, one may, might ask, why did the Jewish man choose to go to the Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? You would be right to assume that the Messenger had a reputation for justice. That would be correct, but that's incomplete. The reality is, in the constitution of Medina, when the Messenger arrived in Medina, in that constitution, the Jewish people of Medina will sort their affairs internally and the Muslims will sort their affairs internally. And when there's a dispute between the Jews of Medina and the Muslims, then the Messenger وسلم, is the ultimate judge, making him the head of state in uh, Medina. So the ayah continues, وَاسْتَغْفِرِ اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا And ask Allah for forgiveness, for indeed Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. An interesting addition here because there is no mention that the Messenger والسلام, was unjust and certainly he was not. But here it's Istaghfirullah, ask Allah for forgiveness from the last part of the previous ayah. Do not be an advocate for the deceitful or do not be an advocate for the treacherous. Now the Messenger وسلم, was not an advocate for Tawmah. But Allah is telling him, beware of making this easy mistake that one can easily make. And seek Allah for forgiveness because we Muslims, we don't ask Allah for forgiveness only after we have committed a sin. We and the Messenger وسلم, are in the habit of asking Allah for forgiveness for the sins we don't know about and for the potential of falling into sin. So anyway, uh, the, the story continues and he took these things and he denied it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in ayah 115, the last one we're going to be covering today, وَمَن يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبَعَ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُصْلِهِ جَهَنَّمَ وَسَاءَتْ نَصِيرًا The brief translation is that he who breaks away from the messenger after the truth has been revealed to him and follows a different path, we will give him, open for him the path that he has chosen. And we will take him to the hellfire and it's a terrible abode. This was revealed about Toma also. And also about him, the, not, the next area, which we're not going to be covering today, it is disputed whether it was revealed about him or not, but it is thought to be revealed about him, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah does not forgive that you associate partners with him, but forgives beyond that whatever he wants. Now, the story of Torma is that in year four, he left Islam and he went to Mecca. And uh, actually before that, he and a group of hypocrites went to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina and they asked him uh, together, and some kuffar, they asked him to stay away from the gods, not to criticize the gods, and not to say that, you know, you, you should move away from them, and to openly declare that these gods, these idols, they have intercession, and it's a way to get close to Allah, it is of benefit. The Messenger was unhappy with that, of course, and he did not uh, do that, needless to say. So anyway, in year four, he left Medina, he went to Mecca, and being a thief, one day he was uh, digging a hole in uh, a wall for one of his neighbors to steal from him. The wall fell on him and he died. He died as a kafir. He officially left Islam. That's the story of Torma. And now when we read the ayat, keep that story in mind. Now, anytime an ayat is revealed in a context, they say, as Babu Nuzul, the reason for the revelation, that context of revelation is a context within which you understand the ayah, but it is not a limit to the meaning of the ayah. So in the context of the story, now we're going to go through the rest of the ayah. 
After astaghfirullah inna Allah kana ghafuran rahima Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah 107 wala tujadil 'an alladhina yaqtanuna anfusahum inna Allah la yuhibbu man kana khawwanan athima and do not argue on behalf of those who betray themselves for indeed Allah does not love whoever has been consistently treacherous or repeatedly or habitually uh, treacherous and sinful wala tujadil 'an alladhina yaqtanuna anfusahum don't don't try to defend and this is very good advice when you're dealing with yourself you do something wrong don't don't defend it but it is doubly so when you're dealing with somebody else if somebody else does something wrong you can seek excuses for them that is valid that's a good thing to do but don't defend the sin you are as a muslim duty bound to stand by the guidance of allah more than you are duty bound to defend muslimin because they happen to be muslim as well so what we hold on to is the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah says, Allah does not love man kana khawwanan from khawin, a person who is treasonous. Khawwanan, habitually treasonous. Athima, deep in sin. Al-ithm, which is a great sin, as opposed to a khati'ah, which is you know a smaller sin, and a khata', which is a mistake. A mistake can cover any of those. يَسْتَخْفُونَ مِنَ النَّاسِ وَلَا يَسْتَخْفُونَ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَهُوَ مَعْهُمْ إِذْ يُبَيِّتُونَ مَا لَا يَرْضَى مَا لَا يَرْضَى مِنَ الْقَوْلِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ مُحِيطًا This perhaps is the central area in this entire context we are covering today. Because in the end, you can't have a guardian on top of everybody. And you can't follow up with everybody. Either people are fundamentally honest in themselves and they are their own guardians, or things will not work out. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they seek to hide from people, but they don't seek to hide from Allah. Allah is always there. And He is with them when they conspire. Whenever they conspire, literally the words they say, whenever they conceal, the speech that is displeasing of Allah. They talk with each other, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. They plot, they plan, and they know this is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They hide it from people, but they cannot hide it from Allah. That's one way to see it. But also, they hide it from people, but they are not ashamed of Allah. So on one hand, it's an act of weak iman that you are willing to sin knowing that Allah is there. But it's also an ayah of reminder, even though you're hiding from people, Allah is always there and Allah always knows. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ مُحِيطًا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes making explicit what is implicit in the first part of the ayah. And indeed, Allah has completely encompasses what they do. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ مُحِيطًا Muhit is one that completely encompasses. If you know, in Arabic, we use the word muhit for the ocean because in old times, they used to believe that there is al-bahr al-muhit, the ocean that surrounds the land mass. And that's kind of the end of the earth when they did not know the shape of the earth. So the name, and that's long, long, long before Islam, from, from hundreds of years before Islam, they believed that that is the surrounding ocean. So that's the same word, muhit. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely encompasses what they do. Hata, uh, is to encompass. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the people of Torah, his own defenders, his own kin who came with him. Ha antum ha ulai, jadaltum anhum fil hayati dunya. Now remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself, from defending Tu'ma, knowing that he has committed a sin. Now, if the messenger himself, who is closer to Allah, to Allah than anyone else, is being given this warning, now it should give weight to Ayah 109. There you are, the defenders of Tu'ma, his kin. It's not clear from the ayah and it's not clear from the history if they are his kin in the sense that they are his family or they are his kin in the sense that they are with him. The, the story does not tell who are the ones defending him, but you can assume just people who are with him. But Muslims, there you are, having argued on their behalf in this dunya, 
in this life. But who will argue with Allah on, on, on their behalf on the day of resurrection? So even though they, you may find people who are defending you in this world, you should know that in the end you are before the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is no one to defend you at that time. Or who is, who is it who's going to be the trustee? Who's going to say, I'm going to pay off that ransom for them? Or I'm going to buy off those shields instead of you know them going to jail? There is nobody. It's just them and Allah. And there is no one who would... There is no one who will, who will exist, but he will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So when we meet Allah on the last day, there's nobody to argue for us. And therefore, the central point here is not if you do wrong, you will be uncovered and people will know and find out. The central point here is that even if people don't find out, Allah always knows and you will pay the price. And you will pay the price and your only currency that you have is soul. So the price is taken out of your soul. It's not taken out of your earnings. That's a very serious thing. And whoever commits evil or does injustice to himself, then asks Allah for forgiveness, he will find Allah most forgiving. Actually, Ghafur is frequently forgiving, continuously forgiving, Rahima, bestower of mercy. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most forgiving, but often forgiven, but also most merciful, often merciful. That is the door that is open for the people who have committed a mistake like Toma. And not everybody who made a mistake like Toma is a munafiq, is a hypocrite. And not everybody is doing it in a sense of defiance to Allah or thinking that, you know, Allah does not matter. People do it out of weakness. And these can be otherwise good people who made a serious mistake, in particular in early life, in late teens and through you know the early 20s and sometimes in the mid and late 20s, people sometimes do things that they completely grow out of. They are not even part of their character. It's not like you've done this and that's just part of you. They completely, totally change from that point on. And that happens frequently, much less frequent when people turn around in their 40s and 50s. But you turn around in your early 20s, you can turn around completely. So whoever commits a sin, the door is open, regardless of their age. If they then ask Allah for forgiveness, they will find that Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. That is the path forward for the one who made a mistake. Now here you have two words, okay? Uh, whoever commits a sin, uh, or uh, uh, or wrongs himself. The su is a sin, any kind of sin. Yadlim nafsahu is the kind of sin that, where it is essentially you are harming yourself. You are doing something, for example, you're duplicitous or you backbite or so. Yes, it harms people, but primarily what you're doing is you are harming yourself. But then there are sins where you steal, where you are directly harming other people as well. We're going to get to that in Ayah 112, bi and whoever earns a sin, he earns it to his own detriment. And Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. In the end, his uncle lost two shields, right? And some other little property. It's a matter of dunya. Wallahi, even if he lost the house, it's a matter of dunya. But in the end, he has harmed his own hereafter. He has harmed his soul. So it's against his own self that he is doing this. And anytime we do injustice by another person, we annoy them, we harass them, we hurt them in dunya, but we hurt ourselves in akhirah. So this is far worse. And that's the reminder of Ayah 111. All our dealings in reality are dealings with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all the dealings with people, Allah adjusts for that, right? You harm somebody, Allah will help them in this world or in the hereafter. You took somebody's property, or you were unjust to somebody, they will be compensated this world or in the hereafter. But you've hurt yourself in this world and in the hereafter. And whoever earns an offense or a sin, then blames it on an innocent person, then he has surely burdened himself with perjury and clear sin, perjury or slander and clear sin. 
Now, again, this is about the story of Thomas, right? Because that's exactly what he did. He wanted the Jewish man to be responsible for it. But the Messenger وسلم, wouldn't have it. And so what's the difference between khati'ah and, and sin? In this context, the khati'ah would be a lesser degree of sin than an ithm. Basically, a khata is a mistake of any kind, whether it's unintentional or intentional, whether it's sinful or not. That would be khata. A khati'ah is a sin. It's not an honest mistake. It's always a sin. An ithm is a great sin. Cannot be applied to a small sin. So whoever does a khati'a, a smaller sin, or an ithm, a big sin, and then he attacks an innocent person, then he has carried the burden of perjury, which is really interesting, or the burden of the slander. Because you think the slander, you're hurting somebody else, but the one who will carry the burden of the slander is the one who is responsible for it, not the one who is on the receiving end of it. وَإِثْمًا mubina And it manifests sin. This is a big deal that you accuse an innocent person. وَلَوْلَا فَضُّ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ وَرَحْمَتُهُ لَهَمَّ الطَّائِفَةٌ مِّنْهُمْ أَنْ يُضِلُّوكَ وَمَا يُضِلُّونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ And had it not been for the grace of Allah and His mercy on you, had it not been for that, a group from among them would have sought to lead you astray, but you would only mislead themselves. Because with eloquent arguments, with good defense, with a fancy uh, argumentation with some evidence being presented, even Muhammad وسلم, does not know the hidden knowledge except as Allah lets him know. So had it not been for the mercy of Allah in his favor, he himself could have been possibly liable to make a mistake. Now the ayah is very clear what it's saying, but I want to highlight here, or the first half of the ayah, I want to highlight here that it's saying something very important outside the direct meaning of the story. If Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself is, can possibly be mistaken, he can, it is possible to present evidence where he will not know the truth. He even says this in a hadith. He says that a, ma, a person will come to me, two people will come to me advocating, and one will be more eloquent than the other, and he will have better evidence, and I will rule on his behalf because I don't have hidden knowledge. And he will be taking what is not his right. Know this, whoever takes this, anything by my judgment unrightly, is holding on a piece of coal. So the messenger himself can make a mistake. And he does not know the hidden knowledge. If the messenger himself can make a mistake, then even the best of judges can make a mistake. So we should be humble when dealing with this and always turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's only with the favor of Allah that he allowed the messenger to see the truth. And they do not har uh, misguide except themselves. They could delude the messenger into a wrong judgment, but they will not delude the messenger out of the right path. They are, in fact, taking themselves out of the right path, the path of Dalaj. And they do not harm you at all. I said, Anzala, of course, it's Anzala. وَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ and Allah has revealed to you the book and wisdom. And he taught you that which you did not know. And the favor of Allah on you, or the grace of Allah on you, has been great. And because Allah uses the past tense, it means the always tense, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has always been great to you. So it is by the favor of Allah that the messenger was able to discern the truth. And it is by the favor of Allah that you and I can discern the truth. By the way, it is only by the favor of Allah that you and I can discern the truth of Islam from the misguidedness of idol worship. لا خير في كثير من نجواهم إلا من أمر بصدقة أو معروف أو إصلاح بين الناس ومن يفعل ذلك بتغاء مرضات الله there is no good in much of their personal conversations, their private conversation. And Najwa is the private conversation. You lean over to the person next to you and you lower your voice. Or you go into a room alone, close the door. That's Najwa. Private conversation. There is no good in much of the private conversation. Except one who commands to giving 
donations. Actually, the Arabic is beautiful. It says even a single donation. إِلَّا مَنْ أَمَرَ بِصَدَقَةِ Had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِلَّا مَنْ أَمَرَ بِصَدَقَةِ With alif lam, it would mean the act of donating. That means repeated donations. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, even the one who, except the one who commands even a single donation. أَوْ معروف, Or an act of good. أَوْ إِصْلَاحٍ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ or reconciliation between people. These are the constructive things that people should be talking about privately how to make happy. And whoever does such a thing, seeking the pleasure of Allah or seeking the approval of Allah, we will indeed give him, uh, the, the Arabic does not say indeed, we will give him a great reward. So instead of conspiring, instead of making stories, instead of trying to, to delude people, try to be an honest person. Now, before going to Ayah 115, from these 10 Ayat we've covered so far, it should be screaming at us integrity. What really this is about. It's about my holding myself to a standard of honesty. My realization that I am actually dealing with my own soul. I'm trading on my own soul. Every time I sin, I'm compromising my soul. I am selling part of it cheap. And every time I do good, I am strengthening my own soul. I'm, to use the Quranic wording, I am purifying my own soul. So I am trading on my own soul when I'm sinning against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all the tricks and foolishness that we engage in we are in reality fooling ourselves. We can't truly harm people. And we certainly cannot fool Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The final ayah here. وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَمُصْلِهِ جَهَنَّمَ وَسَاءَتْ نَصِيرًا And whoever opposes the messenger, whoever breaks away from the messenger, after clear uh, after uh, guidance has been made clear to him or guidance has been made evident to him and he follows a path other than the path of the believers we will open to him to uh, we will turn him toward what he has turned toward he turns away toward misguidedness we will turn him toward misguidance we will give him what he has taken we will open the path for him that he has opened for himself this should echo the other ayah that I repeat often. Uh, and man gets nothing but with what he pursues. So we open for him the path that he chose. And we will take him to the fire. And what an evil destination that is. That is the consequence. In the ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is presenting dishonesty and accusing innocent people uh, in itself as an act of breaking away from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa This is very well illustrated in our story where the man behaved, he was a hypocrite, so he did not behave with Iman at any point in the story. And that continued until there came the point where he left Medina, he settled in Mecca, until he died, and he, خلاص, there was no need for him to call himself a Muslim. In Medina, everybody was becoming Muslim, he's one of them. But in Mecca, he doesn't feel that need anymore. So he broke away. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, مِن بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى After clear guidance, the guidance is made clear to him. Because there are people who opposed the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam back then, they honestly did not know the truth back then. And in modern times, there are many people who do not accept Islam. They even reject Islam and oppose Islam, not because they are rejecting Allah and His guidance, because they don't know enough and they reject what they think Islam is. Some of these people, when the truth becomes evidence to them, they become not only Muslim, but the best of Muslims. So in conclusion, my dear brothers, my dear sisters here, we are dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can fool no one but ourselves. We can harm no one but ourselves. And in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is entirely in control. We are not going to deprive anybody from risk that is due to them. 
And we're not going to give somebody something that is not theirs. That is the major lesson of these. And the secondary lessons of these, we also must not come to the defense of such people. We cannot justify and the injustice of an unjust person. We can be kind toward the unjust person. We can try to approach them in such a way that maybe they stop their injustice. That would be a good thing. But we cannot uh, uh, defend the injustice that they have committed. So with this, inshallah, I uh, conclude my remarks. And uh, let me see if there are any uh, comments here. Bismillah. I don't see any uh, questions so far. So if there are any questions or comments, I'm happy to take them at this point. Jazakallah khair, Brother Mazin. Well, yeah. Inshallah, the first question, um, you mentioned towards the beginning that um, we can seek forgiveness for our sins that we've already done. But if I understood correctly, we can also seek forgiveness for any sins we may do in the future. Yes. Uh, can you just elaborate a little bit on that? How yes, do we so. go about asking for forgiveness for things that we may do in the future? Yes. So you ask for forgiveness for sins that you have committed that you know you have committed. This is very obvious. Everybody knows it, right? But then there are two other important categories. First, you have asking forgiveness for sins you may have committed and forgotten about or did not even realize it was such a bad thing, right? So you do that. But you also ask for, for forgiveness for things that, you may come, that may happen in the future, meaning that you are reaffirming right now that even the mistakes I do in the future, oh Allah, I, I disown them. Because that's what seeking forgiveness is. Oh Allah, cleanse me from my sins. Would you like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cleanse you from your past sins? Yes. What if you make a mistake in the future? Oh Allah, I believe in you. You are my Lord. I worship you. I make mistakes. Forgive them all for me. Even the ones that are going to come, just forgive them all. Oh Allah, when I meet you on the last day, just wipe it all clean. That's an act of affirmation. And Allah loves that. That you disown your sins even though you've committed them. Even though you continue to commit them, but you don't embrace those sins. Is that clear? Yeah. Jazakallah okay. Right. Um, on the topic of a habitual sin, mm -hmm. so if one had committed a sin, they asked for forgiveness, it happened again, they asked for forgiveness, yeah. it happened again, they mm -hmm. asked for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, is that a habitual sin? Well, I mean, that's not the definition of a habitual sin, but as for the hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Every time they ask for forgiveness, if they are sincere, they are forgiven. Even if they go back to it over and over and over. But then they also repent over and over and over. Why do we want the sin to stick, but the repentance not to stick? They both, you know, act. And so long as a person is insisting on seeking forgiveness, then every time they commit the sin and they ask Allah for forgiveness, yes, they are forgiven, if they are sincere, of course, not playing. Yes, they are forgiven, and Allah makes it easier for them that much easier yeah. to repent from the sin. But that's different from a habitual sin. Habitual sin is two kinds. Either you have a habit, you can't stop it. That's not repeated. A habit is a habit because it, com it comes naturally and you have to fight it. But repeated, just something that happened five times, right? So, I, so, um, so a habitual sin is a habit. It's a little bit harder to kick than a, ha than a sin that is not a habit. And the same rule that, as I mentioned, applies. But there is a different form of habitual sin where you no longer disown the sin. You come at a point and say, Khalas, that's it. Okay, or, you know, that's who I am. And so you don't feel bad about the sin anymore. So you've allowed the sin to stick to you. At that point, you are moving away, you are moving yourself away from the mercy of Allah. The mercy of Allah can be found in seeking forgiveness sincerely and hating the fact that you're committing the sin, so don't embrace it. Okay? Is there a relationship between weakness of Iman and sin? Yes, absolutely. The weaker the Iman, the weaker the natural shield is from sinning. And the stronger the Iman, the stronger you have a natural shield. Remember the difference between Iman and Taqwa? So taqwa is you make an effort. But every time you exercise taqwa, your iman increases. That means doing good things becomes easier and doing sins becomes harder. So when your iman is low, you find it more tempting or easier to commit those sins. But the, the factor that is in your hand 
is the factor of taqwa, which means that when you find that shaitan is acting strong on you today, you have to act strong back. The battle between us and shaitan is this amazing battle. It is a battle between you and your true enemy, but you get to decide the outcome every time, like literally. Every single time, shaitan only wins when you choose for shaitan to win. If you obey shaitan by mistake, you forgot or you did not know, these are all, these are not real sins. When you obey shaitan willingly, you sin willingly, then you are choosing for shaitan to beat you. So this battle is in your hand and in mine. Why do you ever allow shaitan to beat you? Because you and I are weak. So that strong iman is the strength with which we push away shaitan. Jazakallah. And now on the same topic, um, what are some of the approaches that we can use uh, to really make that shield stronger? You know, things like, you know, staying in a state of wudu, you know, asking Allah to protect us. You know, can you just review some of those approaches that we can use to help protect ourselves from committing the sin? So there are two broad categories of things that we can do. Category number one, are the rituals that remind us of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dua, istighfar, salah, reflection, reading the Quran. These are all acts that increase our iman and create the stronger shield. And they will just naturally push us away from sin. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, you know, indeed salah uh, stops you from uh, indecency and sinning. Just the nature of salah, right? It just, it, it helps you move away. So you have the ritual acts. But then you have something else that you can do, which is when you find yourself in a situation where you have a choice, there is an intellectual exercise to remind yourself of the benefit of making the difficult choice. You're really angry right now. The person in front of you has really irritated you and words were said. And at that moment, you choose to withhold your anger for one reason that Allah said that he loves that in the Quran. You just make that choice, that conscious choice. So this now, you're not no, no longer just relying on your natural Iman. You are making the positive effort to increase your Iman. Uh, the other thing, in that, there is one very important thing to do. Enjoy when you do something good. When you have given a charity that is a little bit bigger than what you normally do. Take the time to think of the effect of this charity on people. Think of that, you know, that, that person who was late paying the rent and you helped them pay the rent and think that if I were in this situation, what would happen to me and how happy you would be if you were in that situation. Think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to remember it and you will get a huge reward on the last day. Think even the smallest act of charity becomes a huge reward on the last day with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of this. You are taking pleasure in the khayr that you have done. This is not arrogance. This is gratefulness to Allah. You are not in the habit of doing qiyam al -layl. One day you did qiyam al -layl. Don't come the next day and say, hey, I'm such a great guy. I prayed qiyam al yesterday. But think instead, how much barakah did I get yesterday? I want more of that. And that's an encouragement. And with time and with repetition, what is difficult in a one-time act eventually becomes a repeated act, eventually becomes a habit. Just like the habitual sins, there are habitual good deeds and habitual shields to those sins. Jazakallah khair. Well, yeah. Um, it's a question here. I had committed a sin, but then repented and promised to never repeat it. I have kept that promise after becoming a Muslim. Yes. Is there any particular sin that God will not forgive? Don't go back to shirk. <laughs> And uh, okay, so Allah is very clear and categorical in the Quran. As for sins for which a person sought repentance, there is no limit. There is no sin of any kind whatsoever that Allah cannot forgive. But you have to understand there are consequences to the sins. So if you hurt somebody, there is a consequence to that pain you could be freed from the sin, the evil of that act, because you have repented, but you still owe that person compensation. So 
no matter what the sin is, it can be forgiven. Is it going to be forgiven or not? It's up to Allah, but the messenger told us that if you are sincere, Allah will forgive it every time without exception. The other type though is sins for which you did not ask for forgiveness. You forgot or you moved on or you didn't think it was a big deal or so. Then it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So long as it is not the act of shirk, of associating partners with Allah. As long as it's not that, Allah says in the Quran, He does not forgive that other than he is worshipped beside him and forgives beneath that to whomever he wills, meaning to anybody he wills, for any sins as he wills. So that is the door. Now having opened the door very wide, it is Allah who decides when he opened that door. Not you, not I, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a beautiful thing, by the way, that you have made a, a vow and you have kept the vow over time, whether that vow happened before you were Muslim or that vow happened while you were Muslim, it's truly a beautiful thing to make, to promise yourself or to promise Allah something and to keep it. Most people don't. So also you should know that even though all sins before Islam are wiped out by becoming Muslim, not all good deeds before Islam are wiped out by becoming Muslim or none of them get wiped out by becoming Muslim. So if you picked up good habits before Islam, they carry with you into Islam. Jazakallah khair, Brother Mazen. Uh, inshallah, we'll end here. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. And inshallah, we'll continue with the study of Surah Nisa where we left off. Uh, same time, 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time next Wednesday. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiraq wa atubu alayk. Awudhu billahi minash shaitan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman al-Rahim. Wal asr inna l-insana lafi khus. إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصلوا بالحق وتواصلوا بالصبر سبحان الله العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر